see the rest of us. Uh, so we've been going through a series called What Would You Ask Jesus? In which I'm not, I'm not necessarily saying I've been answering the questions, but I've been trying to address the common barriers to faith that people have, at least according to the studies, the research that's done, uh, the things that people say are the, the stumbling blocks that they had, the reasons why some have even walked away from the faith. All right? And so, uh, right, it's worth addressing these things because each of us, all of us, will go through seasons of, of straying, seasons of doubt, uh, struggle, uh, and that's okay. Jesus had mercy and grace for those who doubted. He, the Bible instructs us to do the same. Jesus was happy to provide evidence for those who doubted that it's not something that is necessarily offensive uh, to God when we go through seasons like that. And oftentimes, much of our trust and hope rests in God's character, God's love that has already been revealed to us that there are many and abundant answers and evidence for us to confidently trust and follow Jesus, yet uh, there will still be times where even someone like the Apostle Paul will admit that he was perplexed, uh, that he was confused about the difficulties that he was experiencing in, in his life, but yet he was not brought to the point of despair. And so I'm not saying that the Bible will answer every single one of your questions. But I will say that there is sufficient evidence for you to step in, to, to follow Jesus, to have a relationship with him. And he will prove himself true every day of your life as you seek after him. And there will be some things that we don't know until we get to the other side of eternity. And that's okay because the character of God the, the love that he's put on display for us is sufficient for us to trust and rely in. And so the, the last question that we're going to ask today has been implicit in all of the criticisms and complaints to theism or Christianity that we've been looking at, and it's this, why should I follow you? Right? Why should I follow you, Jesus? Right? This is really kind of the the behind-the-scenes question that every other kind of nitpick, every other detail that we've been addressing uh, is, is really, it's behind all of it, right? We want to know that we're not wasting our time, we're not wasting our lives uh, seeking after, pursuing someone that uh, is going to result in, in less flourishing, less joy, uh, less purpose and meaning than the life that we think that we could make for ourselves. Right? We want to make sure that if we're following Jesus, that he is, in fact, the right one to follow. All right? That, like, we didn't pick the wrong person, that we didn't bet on the wrong horse. And so it's, it's a worthy question, and it comes with a cost, this following of Jesus. And that's why Jesus himself would recommend you take the time to count that cost, that you don't, uh, in a fickle sense, decide to make a commitment to pursue him uh, when he wants to have a deep and authentic relationship in which you follow him. And so today I'm going to read a whole bunch of different statements and claims that Jesus made about himself uh, in which he's attempting to describe for us the significance of following him, the transformation that it produces. And what's interesting is he is the God who created us, who created our needs and our senses, uh, who created uh, many of our desires that right, are these godly desires that he's given us, uh, that he's created all of these things, these relationships that he's blessed us with, and then Jesus is going to use those experiences to try to convey the significance and transformation that happens when you decide to follow him. Right? He speaks to us in a language not necessarily of, of intellect and reason in these particular moments, but he speaks to us through analogy and through kind of our deepest needs and deepest desires, deepest relationships. And so I'm going to hit a whole bunch of these. And just because Jesus is using metaphor or analogy does not mean that the reality he is describing is somehow not true. All right? That a metaphor describes something that is 
real. All right, an analogy describes something that is authentically able to be experienced. And Jesus is not overselling what he offers. It's not, he's not overpromising what he's willing to give you. And so we're going to pick up in John chapter 3, and I'm going to hit a whole bunch, rapid fire, through the Gospel of John today. Uh, so pick this up here, John chapter 3. This is uh, when Nicodemus, a religious leader, comes to visit Jesus in the night. And so, verse 2. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. All right, and so like, he's kind of saying like, Jesus, it's obvious that God is working through you and in you. And then like, it's kind of like, well, what should we do, Jesus, right? Like, I'm coming to you secretly because I don't want all my friends to know that I'm trying to figure out who you are and what to do with you. And Jesus answered him, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That Jesus begins using this idea of of a new birth to describe the transformation that occurs with what he's about to offer. All right, and he says that apart from this being born again, you won't even see or be able to experience or fathom or perceive the kingdom that God invites you into. Verse 4, Nicodemus said to him, probably the same question that many of us would have, Like, what does this mean, Jesus? How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. And so that last phrase that you is plural, it's y'all, it's right, you all must be born again. Don't be surprised that he says that this is something that you must experience. And so when Jesus is trying to describe this transformation that takes place, he's, he's suggesting that it's as drastic as not existing and existing. It's as drastic as not being able to see and then suddenly being able to see. All right, it's as significant as literally coming into life for the first time and experiencing life on this earth. He says, that's what I'm inviting you to. That's the best way that I can describe it for you, Nicodemus. And so I want to suggest that he's suggesting that this is something that you can have and you can only have when you've decided to follow him. Another person, another moment, another experience in John chapter 4, verse 10, there's this woman at this well in Samaria And uh, she's had a a shady past to a degree, and Jesus tells her everything about her past, but with love and compassion. And Jesus tells her, right, in verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. And so notice Jesus, uh, without pride, without ego, right, and the humility that Jesus is, but accurately describes himself as the gift of God and the one who can give and source this living water for us to experience and enjoy. He says, you would, be able, you would have asked and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And so once again, Just like Nicodemus, it goes back to this like practical human experience. Like, how can you be born again? Right? Jesus, how are you going to get this water for me? We're in the middle of this desert village, and there's one well, and you have nothing to draw it with. In fact, you just asked me to get you water. Right? And so there's this very like practical, logical, reasonable, reasonable sense, but they're not getting the thing that he's trying to give. She says, are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. Right? God created us with bodies. Jesus created us with bodies with the ability to sense and have thirst. This desire in which our bodies signal to us that we don't have enough fluids. Right? And, and he's using that experience, that desire, that craving that we have, to try to develop a thirst in her for something real, right? Something deep. 
right? He says, whoever drinks from this water, they're going to be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And so Jesus uses this idea of of having our thirst met as a way to convey to us the significance of this relationship that we have in him, only in him when we decide to follow him. And he says that not only is your thirst met in him, it will remain met permanently when you come into relationship with him. A similar analogy continues in John chapter 6. This is a, a... sermon that he preaches in which he loses just about everybody and he even thought his disciples were going to walk away. John 6 verse 35, Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And so coming to Jesus means that you and I When we experience him in this way, we'll never be hungry, never be thirsty again. Our lives will have purpose and meaning. We will be satisfied, satiated, and saturated in him. And in contrast, without him, we will be hungry and thirsty, seeking and searching without ever being filled in this way. And Jesus, what's interesting is he's talking to this group. He says, listen... I said to you that you have seen me and yet do not believe. And many times he's like, hey, if if you're not going to believe the words I'm saying, at least believe the evidence that's in front of your your eyes, right? Believe the very works of God that are on display in front of you, right? And so so he's, he's willing to meet them in that place of reason and logic, but he's inviting them to something that they have a hard time fathoming. In uh, John 6, verse 40, He says, for this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. And so now he's describing being filled, having our thirst met, and now experiencing this life that will never end, is what he's inviting us into. Verse 41, so the Jews grumbled about him because he said, I'm the bread that came down from heaven. Right? So this phrasing offended them. They said, is, this, is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he now say, I've come down from heaven? Right? And so once again, they're thinking of, of natural things. They're thinking with worldly wisdom about Christ. They're like, no, no. I know this guy's mom and dad. We know who this is. And how is he saying that he came down from heaven? And so they refuse to receive this bread of life. They refuse to receive this living water that he's offering them because they're getting hung up on this practical, worldly wisdom. In verse 47, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. They actually, earlier on, say, like, our father Moses gave us this bread. And he's like, no, he didn't. My father gave them bread in the wilderness, this manna that provided and sustained their needs for an entire 40-year generation. But he says that bread wasn't even all that special. You know, they even put it in the Ark of the Covenant, a sample of it, to preserve it. But he's like, the people who ate that still died. The people who ate that still would experience hunger, but God is doing something bigger and more significant in the life and ministry of Jesus. That this bread that came down from heaven was going to meet the needs of humanity in some way that earthly bread, even heavenly bread, could not ever do apart from him. That he was going to give them life. He's the bread of life. And the way we partake of that bread is peculiarly enough through belief, through receiving what he comes to offer. In John 8, he continues with these types of analogies. He says, uh, again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever, once again, follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so, right, light is the very first thing God creates 
in this universe. And Jesus is taking credit not only as the creator, but he says of himself, like, I am the light of the world. I'm the one who has stepped down from heaven into darkness to bring this light as an offering for people to experience, to invite them into. And he says, those who choose to follow him will no longer walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so following Jesus means experiencing light. It's as drastic as experiencing light for the first time, right? It's like going out into the woods and wilderness without a flashlight at a starless night and stumbling over everything you come across and then suddenly having the sunrise and being able to see the obstacles and walk a life in the wisdom of Christ in which you're not falling for every trap and snare of our own hearts and sinful desires, right? We're not stumbling across everything, that we understand truth and reality as it actually is, that, that he's talking about our senses, our thirst and our hunger and our sight, our, the life that we experience. And he's like, listen, when you follow me, you'll finally experience reality in the fullest sense that I desire for you, that you'll experience reality that had been lost by Adam and Eve, and I now invite you back into. In John 8, 31, Jesus says this, So he said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples. And so he's describing a little bit of what this following him means. If you remain in, continue in his words, all right, the words of truth and life. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Oftentimes, people quote just that second half, disconnecting it from discipleship, from following Jesus. All right, there is a degree of freedom you experience when discovering truth over a lie. But it's not the kind of freedom that Jesus offers here, right? Jesus offers us so much more, and it's only experienced when we follow him, when we remain in him, when we abide and continue in his words, that we make ourselves like an apprentice, a disciple of his, that we're desiring to live a life modeled after his example. All right, that's when we experience freedom. And this, once again, is offensive to these people. They get caught up on this little word, and they're like, no, 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 wait a minute. What? Right, and, and this is what they say. Verse 33, they answered him, we are offspring of Abraham, and we have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? And, and that's actually, right, not quite true, because you might remember like 430 years of slavery and all that, and then also like multiple exiles, and even at this time, they were under the oppression of the Roman Empire, but they're not really like free, but you know, for the sake of their own pride in that moment, of course they're going to say that, because they don't want Jesus to be the one to set them free. And they say, how can you say you will become free? And so they're caught up on this physical reality, uh, that's what they're thinking of. And Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave of sin, right? Many people are offended with Christianity because they're like, oh, it's, they're so caught up on these ideas of sin, all right? And the reason we care about sin in our own lives and, and fight it and put it to the death, right? The reason we care about sin in the lives of other people is because they're literally enslaved, they're oppressed by it. Right? This is the human experience. And Jesus describes it this way, right? Everyone who practices, who makes a living pursuing those things is in fact a slave. They aren't living in freedom. They're not experiencing their own life choices as though like, I'm deciding what's best and is good for me. No, they're actually enslaved to those very things. And so by speaking against sin, it's the reason we do that as followers of Jesus, is because Jesus is pro-freedom, right? We want to see people set free from slavery to sin. Verse 35, he says, The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So, if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And so Jesus describes following him 
as experiencing uh, this, this discipleship in him that brings about this freedom from truth, right? Freedom brought about by truth. There we go. That's a little better, <laughs> right? And as a result, we experience this relationship with him as the son of God, and he sets us free, and we are free indeed, all right? And so he's describing this relationship not only as hunger being met, thirst being satiated, right? Uh, life and, and light, he's now describing it as liberty, right? Freedom that we experience. John chapter 10, he's going to hit a whole bunch of these. He says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. And so Jesus describes salvation can only be accessed through him. And so in following him and in pursuing him, being a disciple of Christ, then we can enter in through him as the door. And then he continues. He says that he's not the only spiritual entity at work in this world. He says the thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. Right? That there are those in opposition to your freedom, in opposition to the life that God wants for you. Right? That would lead you to believe that it's going to make you like God when you are knowing good and evil, right? Just like the serpent in the garden. But the thief is not out for your good or for your flourishing. He's come to destroy you. But Jesus, in contrast, says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. That's what Jesus is about. He's about you and I experiencing freedom and life. That's what Jesus is about. And it's not only the things that he produces in us, it's the love and character that he has that he's put on display for us. In verse 11, he hits another one of these. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees a wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. And so in contrast, Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd. I actually care about you. I'm willing to lay my life down for you. Right? It's not that he's merely producing right, this bread of life, this living water, right, this life, this new birth in us, but he also actually cares about us in the process. He also was willing to sacrifice his own life in order to bring us this new life. Verse 14, I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay my life down, lay down my life for the sheep. And so Jesus is one who loves you. That we can, even when we might not know everything, we can follow him because of his character and identity, right? Because of what he's already done and, and lived on display. He's demonstrated his great love for us when we were his enemies. And built within this whole implication of him being the good shepherd, is you and I being sheep that hear his voice and that follow him, right? That recognize he's someone that we can trust. Verse 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And so what's cool is we are fully known by him. We don't have to fear him suddenly discovering our dark past. We don't have to fear him discovering that we still stumble in sin. He literally knows everything about you, and he still loves you, and he still lay his life down for you. There's no fear of this future where he's going to say, you know what, I'm not a fan. I'm going to back away. I'm going to step away from this relationship. I won't be your life giver, your sustainer, your liberator, because no, you're too costly to me. He will not ever say that. And his sheep, we know, we'll know his voice and we'll follow him. Verse 28, I give them eternal life 
and they will never perish, and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. That Jesus is going to protect us. He's going to hold on to us. Verse 29, my Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. I and the Father are one. And so Jesus' claims become bolder and bolder, where he's actually saying he's equal to the Father. Right? That Jesus is the means through which we can know God. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the perfect representation, the reflection of God's glory in every way. He's the means through which we have access to the Father because He is the door. In John 11, this is uh, prior to Lazarus being raised from the dead, and Lazarus' sister comes to Jesus, and Jesus is talking about this idea of resurrection, and she's once again, she's got some faith here, which is incredible, right? But missing this, uh, you know, caught up on this practicality and trying to wonder, who is this Jesus? She says, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Right? That's, that's still a statement of faith. Right? That's, that's pretty good. Like, that's awesome. But Jesus said to her, like, he's, he has more than merely the authority to raise the dead. All right? He has more than just the power of life and death. Okay? This is what it's, he says. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Right? Do you believe this? And so Jesus is life itself. He is resurrection itself. He's the one who will raise us on the last day. And he has authority to raise the dead now. Right? That Jesus has complete authority over all of these things. And he is the life-giving spirit. He's the one that gives us this new birth that brings us to life. And the way we experience this, experience this is by living in him, believing in him. Right? It's not a result of our own good works, but by receiving what he's already done. John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. This is at the Last Supper, the day before he dies. Believe in God, believe all also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? So think about this. Even in his, uh, what appears perhaps to be absence, although he's with us to the end of the age and he's given us his spirit, he is, in what appears to be his absence, preparing a place for you and I. He's still thinking about us. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. He intends on being with you and I for all of eternity. He doesn't want to just give us eternal life and then just stay, you know, stay over there though. Like, I don't don't want to see you for all eternity, but I'll give you eternal life, right? Like, no, he wants to be with you and I. He cares about us as the good shepherd who lays down his life, and he wants to be with you forever. He wants to never lose relationship with you. Verse 4, and you know the way to where I'm going. And now Thomas, once again, as humans, being very practical, Lord, we don't know where you are going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and have seen him. And so Jesus is the very way in which we experience eternal life. He is the way in which we experience this life more fully when we follow him. That he is desiring to have us walk in truth and freedom, to experience life and fullness and abundance, to never be hungry, to never thirst again as a result of what he offers us. And what he gives us in this life is not merely for our good, but is meant to bring about something good for others and for God's glory. In John 15, he says, I am the true vine. 
and my father is the vine dresser. Skipping down to verse 4, he says, abide in me, right? Continue, remain in me, and I in you, as the branch, in this analogy we're branches, not sheep, the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine and you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And so Jesus claims that a life lived separate from him, a life lived not following him, not remaining, not continuing in him, is a life that will be unfruitful. A life that will appear to possibly thrive for a moment, but will have no eternal benefit, no outcome that will pass beyond these moments and these breaths. That apart from him, it's as though we literally cannot accomplish anything. But Jesus desires that we remain in him, that you and I would bear fruit that we would not merely be beneficiaries of all of this blessing and abundance that he gives us, but that you and I would produce fruit for the sake of others to enjoy, that we would walk out the good works that he's foreordained us to walk in, right? that we would experience this life, that we could offer this life to other people. And he desires that we be very fruitful. And lastly, Matthew 11 Verse 28, which notice is not in the Gospel of John. Jesus describes this experience this way. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Right? Jesus intends on us following him. He wants to teach us. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And so relationship with Jesus is not just going to fill you and to quench your thirst, but it's going to be like you've been working hard, fatigued, exhausted your whole life, and you finally experience this rest that God has for you. And it's this perpetual rest where, yes, we will still worship the Lord with our hard work, right? We'll honor God in the way that we live, right? We'll still walk out those good works for the sake of loving others and loving God, but we'll never be resting uh, on our own good works, that our identity will not be relying upon our own goodness and the things that we do, that we'll be able to do those strengthened by Him, empowered by His Spirit, flourishing because he's the vine and we're the branches, right? And that we don't have to like be frantically trying to figure out how we're going to be producing this fruit. The way we do it is just simply by following him, by abiding in him, by remaining in him, continuing in his word and experiencing this truth that is going to transform us completely. And it does cost us dearly, all right? It costs a lot to follow Jesus. We must be willing to give up our lives to follow him. We must be willing to deny ourselves to follow him. And that's why it's a valid question. Why should I follow you, Jesus? Because it's going to cost me a lot. Why should I follow you, Jesus? Because you're presuming I now am going to tell others about you under the presumption that they too should follow you. That Every life on this earth, the right response would be to spend every moment of it following you. And so it's a, wor a worthy question to ask. Why should I follow you? Because it's going to cost me everything to do so. But the benefit outweighs the cost significantly. And Jesus paid a far greater cost for us to experience this life than we would ever pay in order to receive it. And so by obeying him and keeping his commandments, we can experience life and fullness and joy and rest and friendship and love. We can have relationship with the God who's made us. We can know his purpose for our lives. 
that we can pursue him and seek him and that we can have his spirit living within us and through us, leading us and guiding us into all truth, empowering us to do the very things that God has called us to. It's worth it to follow Jesus. And I realize this isn't necessarily the most intellectual. It's perhaps more poetic in the way that Jesus describes it. But it's the best way that he can communicate to you and I is through the very means and how he created us and to communicate greatly his message and relationship that he offers through the love that he put on display for you and I. So Ronell, we'll have come back up for one more song and let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that uh, as we think about what you've done and the things you've said, and the life you laid down, I pray that this morning we would think about the tremendous life that you give us, the freedom that you give us, Lord God. Help us to live a life pursuing you, following you, seeking you, seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, that we would be able to experience all of these things. Help us to not be distracted by the world, to be ensnared by sin, to be weighed down by the cares of this world to be choked out by comfort or the love of money or whatever these things may be. Help us to remain and abide in you as your disciples. Help us to follow you with our whole heart. Help us to love you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And God, I pray that this morning that we, as we seek you, would experience this rest that you desire for us to have. That none of us would be fighting in our own strength to experience salvation and righteousness. That none of us would be battling in our own energy, but we would rest surely in you, following you, and live by the Spirit, keeping in step with the Spirit, that we would experience the life that you desire for us to have. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.